Well, good morning. Um, thanks for uh, coming to my talk about uh, death and taxes. I'm thrilled to say this is the second tax authority presentation at this conference. Uh, I went to the Swedish one <laughs> yesterday and, and now I'm talking about the Norwegian counterpart. Um, I'm myself not Norwegian originally, I live there now um, and I've lived there for a couple of years. And for the last six years actually I've um, worked at Skatetan, um where I have been helping to maintain uh, the taxation process. And normally I speak a lot about my work in open source in the Java space. Uh, I work on ByteBuddy, on Mokido, and um, I've done my share of Silicon Valley style uh, projects. But I always felt like I should uh, rather tell this story um, because computational problems are obviously hard. Um, technical problems are very hard. But um, maintenance and uh, software, um, maintenance over a long time of, of um, period of time, I found much harder. So what I'm trying to do today is to um, summarize uh, what we learned over the last six years, how we kind of um, yeah, kept a, a big project alive that was created um, to do taxes in Norway, and um, what sometimes I feel like isn't really presented at conferences much, um, the, the conservative approach to software, um, which I, uh, I'm guilty of myself. At conferences, you hype up the new tech, and uh, in projects, sometimes the tech doesn't really help you much. But yeah, I won't get too much ahead of myself. Um, before I, I get into how we, um, with a yeah, comparably uh, low number of people, uh, maintain a big software project, I want to explain to you how uh, what we do at Skatetan. And I'm not sure how the Swedish taxation process uh, works. I can imagine it's pretty similar. Um, but basically what we do. Um, so uh, taxes in Norway are actually pretty simple, if you think of it. Uh, if you want to do taxes for 2020, for example, um, we will have to first find all the people who have to pay taxes. And then already in 2019 we have to do that uh, and predict who's probably going to be a taxpayer in 2020 and um, send them a taxation card, a skattekort. And that card basically just says, in 2020, we expect you to pay 39% of your taxes based on your previous income. And we basically correct it um, by expectation on, on, on income increase in the general population, and then send it out. People can then go into our systems at Skattetaten, edit this number. Um, of course, they can just say, 0%. Um, in some cases, we have to trigger manual controls, but we try to automate it as much as possible. And then, of course, over the year of 2020, we will be sent a lot of data from banks, from employers, and so forth, and enrich your taxation data um, to basically prepare already for the taxation we will have to conduct on you in 2020. And then in the end of the year, we will uh, send, basically collect all this data, crunch the numbers, and send you uh, what we call the scutter melding. Uh, where you, in the best case, just confirm and say, yeah, this is, sounds about right. Um, and then we process this pretty quickly and send you a taxation uh, report. And we'll send you back the money you paid uh, over or uh, we'll send you a bill to pay the reminder of the taxes you still owe. And from, from my original German perspective, if, I've, if you've done taxes in Germany, this is something you very much appreciate. Um, but yeah, it, it takes a lot, and um, it's, a, it's a big software system, and basically with 20 people today, around 20 people, uh, yeah, we maintain most of this. So we are in charge of determining um, who's um, eligible for taxes, and uh, we do the entire um, yeah, prediction process, we do uh, the computation of, of um, yeah, what you will have to tax in advance, the data collection we do, uh, and all the, the services for self-management of your taxes and the tax computation itself, as well as uh, sending out the, the, the final reports. We don't do the scutter melding today, um, which is like a project of its own um, and still basically created um, in, a, in a phase where they, they add more and more people. Some people still have to do taxes in, in the old system, which I will uh, get into later. Right, and this is the scutter process and it's basically what we are doing. Uh, and important to know and, and why we struggled a bit uh, over the time um, with maintaining the software was that all of this was created in a big project phase. The, the entire taxation system previously was running on IBM mainframes and uh, that worked kind of well. Um, so there's nothing to complain about. This was also very expensive. And over the phase of uh, 2014 to 2018, the entire system was rewritten uh, onto the JVM. 
and it was rewritten in a larger project. And this is very government style, but it also has um, you know, good reasons behind it because uh, if, if you haven't worked with IBM mainframes, uh, then if you want to renew licenses for mainframes, then you have to do this for five years at a time, and they are very expensive. So we're basically running the clock um, to not having to renew the licenses, and this is why we had this big bundle project with a lot of people. And then 2018, suddenly, we dropped into the maintenance phase, and a lot of the people left. Uh, in the beginning, uh, we kept around 70% of the project team, uh, but today we are, as I said, around 20 developers, and then we still have... 30 people who test, and um, of course experts, lawyers, uh, taxation um, yeah, professionals that kind of tell us what we have to do, because I think this is, if you compare tech in, 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 in Silicon Valley or tech in regular projects, is that we cannot just decide on things ourselves. We don't own the domain. If you do like developer tooling, what I've done before, um, like APM tooling or security tooling, then you build a product. You decide what you want to put in, but of course, obviously, with the taxation software, we can't just say, we want to prioritize this now because this is what we feel like uh, doing, but um, and that fits the domain right now. But we ha have a very externally dependent. Yeah. So, saying how we work, this is exactly what we do. DevOps. We basically try to push out stuff quite regularly, uh, and we do the regular tooling around it. But um, we are still rather slow um, compared to many companies. We do microservices. Um, we have around a thousand services that we bundle into a hundred applications. Um, and, but we don't roll out that quickly compared to others um, because we, if we roll out a mistake and we um, basically charge taxes we shouldn't charge or even worse, we pay back money that we shouldn't pay back, there's a good chance that the government never sees this money uh, anymore. So we are a rather conservative org um, for reasons. Um, but yeah, we basically also have, have to look into not, not overcharging people because if we make mistakes, if we keep too much taxes of, of people, and this can quickly become a big problem for some families that live on, on a margin. Uh, so we really try to yeah, not, not mess up too much. But of course, we are very much bound by external factors. We have to realize laws, so everything we do uh, is, is founded in government regulations and, and externally decided, and it's basically just imposed onto us, and this is a big um, yeah, reason also why, why our software development routines are a bit different and, and require a lot of restraint. Um, but of course we have our own ideas and we try to realize them, uh, but of course we also have to look a lot into security, uh, especially in these daring times we live in, uh, we try to tighten as much as we can because we're yeah, anticipating that yeah, the internet might be, become a more dangerous place in the years to come. But yeah, where we, where we, when I started at Scott Tartan, um, we were um, experienced growing technical debt, and it was difficult to navigate the software. Because, of course, we have non-negotiable release dates. We have to do the taxes at a certain date. Uh, this is something I haven't experienced before, because, of course, in a product company, you can delay a release and say it's not realistic to accomplish this kind of deadline um, at this day. We have to push it back a week or two. Uh, it's got a ton. Obviously, this can't work. Um, <laughs> governments run out of money pretty quickly um, if money doesn't come in uh, at certain dates. There's budgets, yearly budgets, and uh, cash flow is important. Um, not as much for personal taxes, but like if you um, have um, value added tax, so mehrwert of gift. If this doesn't roll in anymore, then um, cash flow um, seals pretty quickly. So, so that's something we have to do with. And then, of course, we have unpredictable requirements. Um, if something happens, like COVID, uh, for example, then there's a relief package for, for um, the economy, and this has to be realized pretty quickly. So if we are told next week we have to um, yeah, um, delay charging taxes for this and that to help companies survive in, in this pandemic, then we have to be able to do it. And as you can guess, this often leads to um, that things get implemented quick and dirty and are rolled out into production, while you, at the same time you still have security requirements and so forth, um, but you still take shortcuts that make it hard to react to new changes that will come anyways in the near future. And all this um, was the, um, the basis of, of yeah, main, like our, our maintenance um, approach that we had to formulate to yeah, get hold of all these issues that we have built up over the years. Right, so 
Uh, before I look into how we maintain um, just the general architecture at Scott to Tartan, um, all um, work at Scott to Tartan is, is basically event driven. Um, and most data, for example, if you are born, how are you becoming a taxpayer in the moment of your birth? Um, we will read the Norwegian Registry of People, the Parts Register, um, which is basically um, a register of everybody, every company, every person. Uh, as in Sweden, everybody gets a number, a, a Fetzels number or a D number, uh, and it's registered immediately. We will uh, observe this birth, um, listen to the feed there, and then process it. Scott has a huge catalog of XSD files. XSD basically defines the entire information structure. And then we have a database, a document database called Scott Info, where we basically, according to these XSDs, can store data. And then we just store a, a value there, and then all systems can observe the change uh, of this document store and again listen to a feed and do new things like computer tax card uh, yeah, or, or send out uh, information like, like the FETSOS number and so forth. Right, and this is triggering new events. And yeah, this is the, the general idea how Scott Tartan is supposed to work on a very high level. Right. But um, giving this event-driven uh, database and microservices, we have also a growing technical stack. In 2014, the project started out on Java 7. Java 8 wasn't uh, available back then. Uh, it was using Jetty, Oracle database, and then over time, we added more and more. And, and um, we, for cost reasons, we also migrated a lot from Oracle to Postgres. Uh, and, and we're using more Spring. And before, we were using Drop Wizard, which has lost uh, some of its traction, so we kind of felt like we have to move. And there's more and more coming. People want to use Kafka, um, which obviously is a good choice for event-driven architecture, and Kotlin, and so forth. So this is where we're at. And of course, Scott Town also wants to move to the cloud over the time. Um, and this is, again, bringing new challenges, right, to, to adopt to new technology. And we can't yeah, just stand still despite having all the domain problems. We also have technical update problems that we have to address. Right. So uh, the big change for us when I came on is that when in the project phase, uh, you could just write software and you could just change software and roll it out um, because we weren't in production yet. Right now, we are in production. The systems have to be always on. And big refactorings have proven to be rather difficult, especially if you have a lot of data. You have created a form of data, a shape of data. Uh, you can't just uh, push something into production and, and refactor the database scheme schema because that might run for hours and then the database isn't available. So um, making changes has become much more costly, um, but um, in general also changing the code has become difficult because we cannot do big rewrites in the background and then push it out. Uh, the people in 2014 that started this project, they wrote their own framework, uh, as people do, um, to run services, which they call plugin application. And it's not, it's not a bad framework. Um, they basically, it's all around these interfaces where you have this init method and stop method where you can uh, start and stop services. And they build around the, the Java service loader API. So you just drop this in into one application and it gets discovered via this meta in file. And all you have to do as a new developer is to implement this interface and draw it into yeah, your IDE and uh, push out uh, the, the application. Um, all features of the framework were encapsulated in this one uh, interface, and this interface grew and grew and grew. Uh, so when I came uh, in, it was already like 40 methods long, and every month or so we added two or three more because we start with SOAP and then suddenly you need to have REST and so forth, and, and we wanted to, to write ourselves away from that. And most logic was bundled in so-called um, yeah, executor services, which was driven by its own home-written executions framework. And basically, uh, what you could do, you would say, I want to um, have certain documents as an input to my met main method, and then I will return new documents that you will write, and the framework will take care of the reading and the writing. So if you just wanted to read from our XML database and from our population database, you would just specify which people and, and what documents, and it will load this in just, um, automatically and just return it. Um, this worked well in the beginning. People didn't have to think much about um, how to implement uh, things and how to integrate against uh, external data stores. But over time, of course, we got new data stores we had to integrate against, and there wasn't any support for that in this home-written framework. And even worse, uh, the integration patterns 
became more complex. Maybe you have to read from one data store based on data you've got out of another data store. And maybe in many services you don't need the offered integrations at all. So, so this, the framework over time grew less and less useful and became more of a burden. At the same time, all code was written around this homegrown framework. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's hard to migrate away from something like this. But this is maybe the first lesson we learned. Um, home, homegrown frameworks uh, seem often like a very big relief in the beginning. You get productive very quickly um, because you can address all the problems you have right now. But the future generations of the software and maintenance um, will not have this luxury because requirements change and the code can't follow up this quickly because the homegrown frameworks aren't as flexible as generic frameworks. If you use Spring, Spring is complicated to many. Many people find it overwhelming, but at the same time, Spring is so generic that it will support future problems as well as it supports current problems. And if you go away from that, you don't have this advantage. So this is something that became clear for me very much uh, during this, this refactoring uh, that, that I had to make here with my team. Right. So um, the other thing, the other problem that a homegrown framework, and I'm not sure if this is, it's just me, but I've seen homegrown frameworks a lot in my career. Um, um, so that's why I'm talking about it so much. Um, the other thing we experience is that the homegrown framework suffers a lot from brain drain and has a high cost of ownership. So the people that created this framework at some point, as you can see here from the missing profile picture, leave the organization. Um, I think we have an average employment um, time of four years, or not even employment, also consultants um, stay on an average of four years, which I find is a long time. But uh, if they start in 2014 and leave in 2018 and they wrote large fractions of a framework that you're using, then the moment this person leaves the framework loses a lot of its value. Uh, also, the code base grew and grew uh, for just this plugin application, generic self-made infrastructure. And uh, we had like half a million lines of code there that we had to maintain and nobody really understood how the framework was, was working. Uh, in detail at least, so that made refactoring scary. Uh, another thing is that people had a lot of great ideas how this framework can, um, for example, support concurrent processing. So people tried to use the ACA platform, where the idea was that you would write a plugin and then you would automatically deploy it on multiple nodes and it would run work in concurrent um, uh, processing but this never worked. So it was kind of half done and the person who wrote this left and we had a lot of ACA code that we couldn't delete because it was still kind of used, but it didn't really give us a advantage either. So another problem with homegrown frameworks is that some extensions take a long period of time to, to do and then you don't have the resources to kind of distribute to work on that uh, and then you can't get anywhere. So another reason not to write your own frameworks from our experience is that uh, this will happen to you as well at some point. So, but the upside was that um, it was interfaced. Um, so like these execute the services, for example, was an interface and we kind of realized that we can probably throw out part of the framework, the, the whole um, service loader API bit and still keep some of it like these services and just execute them a different way. So not, another lesson we learned is that you always have to write code that you can throw out and modularization, for example, uh, some people hate it because you can't just code things in where you need them uh, immediately. But if you keep things separate and you take this extra cost of modularizing uh, your code bases, then you can throw out code. And off, like, I think now after it's not soon 10 years of this project running, we have uh, been able to replace most of the code. Um, so, so code doesn't have this lifetime. I think this is why projects fail it often after like five, six years. You end up in this dead end where just adding a small button somewhere takes a week of work because you haven't modularized, you haven't kind of split up your code base in a way that you can throw out things that aren't needed anymore. Right, so what did we do? So we took this plugin application and we wrote an even bigger framework that supported all of the old APIs. But this extended framework then uh, we could take and um, yeah, basically split it up into modules. Because, of course, in the beginning, you often say you don't want to need it, you keep it simple, straight out in production, right? All this mantra that we always preach that you should be quick and just uh, make things useful right away uh, didn't really work out for us in the long run. Um, instead, we basically had to take a step back, uh, split things up again, um, 
and take things slow, but re-implement the old framework in an even bigger fashion, but on, based on modules. Because what that meant for us and is that we could, in applications where we didn't need all the stuff, right? like as I mentioned before, some applications don't have to read people's data, right? Um, information on, on, on your address and so forth. And then since we before had this big framework, you couldn't take it out. It was part of the big framework. Now we had modules, now we could take it out if we didn't need it. And for the first time, we kind of saw what each service actually needed. Uh, what, and that was already just that. Reading the dependencies and seeing what kind of integrations were required was a big upside for us. And uh, of course, individual updating was also a nice a new feature because if you had a bug in this one API, you could just uh, update this bit and you didn't have to build the whole thing and, and your, your risk of migrating to a new version uh, was reduced quite a lot. And yeah, what we used for that was Spring Boot. So all our integrations basically now are a Spring Boot starter. And this is something I also can highly recommend if you like Spring Boot, other frameworks have similar concepts. Um, instead of basically just having um, Spring's own starters, you can write your own starters, right? And Spring starters, uh, you might know it from, for example, JDBC starters or web starters. You drag it in and it automatically gives you a new feature, like it automatically gives you the feature to run a web server. We took this concept that Spring has and, for example, said, we give you the feature to do authenticated calls, right, in Scatatan's own token infrastructure. Or we give you the feature to um, uh, read from uh, the parts register, so the, the people's data. And now all you need to do is if you write a new service is that you find the starters you need, you add them as a dependency to your service, and you get the features. And you can maintain them basically separately. And um, this gives small, nice modules that people can understand and, and work with, right? What is a starter? If you've never heard of it, just quickly, basically it's a configuration class, uh, a classical spring configuration class, and it gives you basically beans that you can access from your main application. So if you want to read from scutter.info, there's a, there's a client for reading from scutter.info, it's just registered in as a bean, so it becomes available from your main application. And there's a file that you have to add um, in meta in Spring factories where you refer to this auto configuration. This is how Spring implements Spring Boot, basically. All of Spring Boot are these um, yeah, starters that you can drag in. What we also did is we added profile files for all of our environments. So by just specifying on the command line that you're running an SIT, for example, this is our secure test environment, uh, it will configure all the code that it can run against it. So every developer that we get in um, can easily uh, start up an application on their local machine. And this is also something I learned because we have a turnaround, of course, over 10 years, uh, people come and go. And um, it's a long, it takes a long time often to train up new people. And the ability for people to basically take small bits of code, small integrations, and try them out gives them a huge advantage in learning new applications. Because uh, I don't know how, how you do onboarding, but often it's like, hello, welcome to the team, here's a Jira issue, fix it uh, and figure it out yourself and ask if you have questions, right? And that works poorly. These people will be super frustrated, <laughs> they won't tell you, and they won't understand the system because they never work with the integrations. They cannot try out things and just set breakpoints where they want. But the ability to have these starters, you can just tell them, you know what, uh, today you should find out what SCUT info is, you can go in this test environment, uh, create your own Spring Boot application and just try to write something and read something that you get a feel of it. Just set it up and this is how it works, here's a bit of documentation and then they can figure that out. And it's actually an, an eatable uh, amount of work and then after a week they actually are versed in all the integrations and then they can touch the domain code without being afraid of all the bits that are normally hidden. Right. Also, a big advantage is that you can set up mock beans in, in integration tests, so you can just um, mock it out if you wanted to write something. Uh, and uh, what we also do is we use a lot of test containers uh, with, with uh, Docker. So, for example, we can set up a, a Postgres database in the test that is just booted up for the duration of the test, and then, again, you can actually run code on your local machine easily because all the integration is encapsulated in one, one starter. Uh, we had still some problems. Um, as mentioned, um, Scott Tartan has a lot of um, event-driven architecture. So what we normally do is we read like feeds, and then Scott Tartan uh, was out with this early. Uh, Scott Tartan has done event-driven architecture uh, since 25 almost, 
and the weapon of choice back then was to publish all data as atom feeds, like, like blogs, really. Um, and this uh, is still around and it works well, in a way, so it's surprisingly well. Um, but there's a lot, lot, lot of good tooling for reading atom feeds. And what we found is that, uh, yeah, in Scottish a lot of people wrote their own readers, and we tried to solve basically the feed reading issue once and for all because we have very many different flavors of atom feeds around, unfortunately. Also, something we need to do is uh, we need to read feed backwards often um, because, like, let's say you are um, getting born, right, and there's a lot of things that happen. Your name gets registered, and all of these things are an event, and people get annoyed if they get, like, a a message for every event that happens, so we don't want to process things in real time always, but sometimes we just want to process it once a day, and then we're just interested in the last event, and we want to filter out all previous events. And that requ yeah, requires us to process data from newest event to oldest event, but sometimes some events have special meaning, so we can't just skip them, but yeah, there, there's some infrastructure, and we just wrote a starter for that ourselves as well. And this is more of a technical starter, where you basically can just implement an interface where you explain how to, to read a feed. And then this, this is giving you the infrastructure to do so, all the storage and, and processing of the feed is encapsulated in the starter. And then instead, all the, the components that offer feed reading, like you can read a feed of the, the people's registry, you can read a feed of the, um, the XML document base, they have configurations that only become active if those configurations discover the other starter, right? So Spring Boot has support for that, where um, some configurations become conditional on other existing integrations, right? So this is also a great feature Spring Boot offers. Uh, we did something similar for um, jobs because we had a very specific Oracle-dependent task execution framework that was built in 2014. And we had to kind of support it to being able to migrate code. So we kind of built a, a, a database uh, model that was similar, but we now implemented it for Oracle, Postgres, and with limited support for ANSI SQL. And then basically what we did is just we built an abstraction on top of this abstraction again, uh, such that you can migrate easily. This is not something that we want to keep on the long run, but as a migration step. Uh, this, is, this worked out quite nicely. So, but how did we migrate then in practice? Basically, if you have an app, any of our 1,000 um, services looks like this today or looked like this uh, a couple of years back, uh, you write an app and the app uh, has a dependency in plugin application. This dependency we just threw out and drew in our new Spring Boot-based um, plugin application starter. And this starter then is basically dragging in all of the other starters that we've written in the background. And the um, actual uh, refactoring of the code base then looks like this, that you first take a new starters for the new integrations that the original framework didn't support if you need them, so we can get new features out without changing the framework that we found out we couldn't change anymore because it became too complex. And then we took out the plugin application starter in the end and only activated the starters that we actually needed for this particular application. Uh, we kept the task processing bit in the beginning because it was very in integral to many apps, and then over time we also took those out. And this basically had this big monolo monolithic framework structure was the only way we could replace it by basically breaking it down beneath and then taking out the main module. And yeah, we've done this for two, three years now, and we have seen a lot of productive productivity improvements since, so this really worked out for us. Yeah, another issue, even I would say the more pressing issue we experience is that uh, we have to work with changing teams. Um, code bases or technical problems, as I mentioned in the beginning, are hard, but uh, the, the human problems uh, are often harder. Uh, and something, again, we, we um, yeah, experience is that this project uh, created a lot of so-called superhero developers uh, who basically took responsibility for a big segment of code. And if you want to change something, um, in this segment, you basically had to talk to person X. And if person X wasn't available, it, everything would take forever or wasn't even impossible. 
Uh, so another um, thing that we actively pursued in our project now is that we don't have these people anymore. Uh, they left when the project was over. And now we are trying to do actual measures to avoid having these superhero developers anymore. And, and yeah, because even though they can be super practical, if you have a production issue, uh, you know you can ask this person and they will know how to answer. Uh, in, in general, on average, it's bad to have them still, not because it's bad to have really good people in your team, but because you will be much more vulnerable in a small team if, if a single person leaves. And uh, the, word, the, word, uh, the approach for that is that we yeah, proactively distribute the hard work. If we know that the task can be solved by person X the easiest, we will still give it to person Y. Uh, just to basically have the, the, the ability to, to uh, move issues around uh, and not depend on single people. Uh, it sounds counterintuitive, you want to be productive, you want to solve things fast. But on average, again, it, it helps a lot because, um, yeah, no matter who's at work, and, and I can like I can be here and give a conference presentation without being afraid to be called up because System X isn't working. This is, gives a huge benefit and also gives people an ease, right, to to work with things. And after some time, people lose the fear. Um, we experienced like in the beginning, it was, it was kind of if you ask someone to solve an issue that everybody knew another person would solve e more easily. Uh, people were at unease because it felt like this is an exceptional um, approach that we take this time. Uh, but now, since it became normalized, people just do it, and it turns out it's not that bad anyways. Uh, another thing we have started to uh, reverse on is, and this is kind of the irony of, of technology, uh, that um, we have a lot of, we had a lot of stuff. People want to do new tech, they want to use Kotlin, and we got even more things in, and our, our technical stack um, in new services was was suddenly so so yeah overwhelming that it wasn't possible anymore to teach up new developers, uh, and we get a lot of people from university. Um, you, as you all know, tech recruiting is hard, uh, and of course, uh, Scott Tartan is a great place to work, and, and we advertise that. But young people often want to do yeah cool new technology and, and we can't compete with a Silicon Valley type um, company if that's what people set their mind to. Um, at the same time, people come from university and they don't know what Maven is, right? And they come to your project and say, yeah, this is the Kafka pipeline pushing data out and then it goes here and this is GitHub and here's Postgres and this is Oracle, this is database, this and that, here's window functions and this is old drop as a system and, and you can just see how they fade away while you try to explain the system. And the, the issue is not only the, the technology, you have all the tools that most people will never, never have heard of before. And since university is such an important recruiting arena for us, um, we kind of had to step down on this, right? And it's not only that, it's they have to look at the system map. We have microservices, a thousand of them. Uh, I don't know all services. I've been there for since 2016, and I, I still discover new services every month. So, so it's not an easy task. So, what we did, uh, yeah, and it took us about one year to get someone up to speed in the beginning, right? So what we instead we said we have to decide on, on things and we have to cut down. So what we, for example, did we threw out all Groovy tests, we threw out all Kotlin code um, because that's two less programming languages people have to learn, and, and that's a huge productivity uh, gain. We settled on SQL for everything. We have decided not to use Kafka. Um, we have decided not to use reactive programming, and, and there were a lot of there was a lot of desire to use new tech um, around, but, but it kind of made the stack so unlearnable uh, for new developers. It was fun for the ones that already were used to all the tech, but we try to now optimize the experience for someone who comes in and we accept that they will leave after two or three years because they will get bored, but they will get bored anyways. They will seek new challenges anyways. So uh, we then instead try to make things consistent and, and learnable, right? So. Today we have around 100, 190 developers who committed and we get new people every month still. So out of 20 people, um, I think we have one or two people come in and out every month. Uh, yeah, and the spaghetti that we had wasn't uh, approachable, so now we have very strict rules on code style. Um, also we try to calm people down even on the use on Lambda expressions, which are great, uh, not Lambda streams, I mean streams are great, but sometimes a loop cuts it, so we try to really de-fancy our code base. We have strict rules what languages to use, 
uh, what frameworks are allowed, what API is allowed, and um, yeah, how you develop. And it sounds very unmodern in a landscape where you see like, yeah, small teams, do however you want it, do find your own way. Um, but on the long run, since these teams might have this ownership in the beginning, but then this ownership fades when the people leave, um, so this didn't work out for us, right? And this new strict rule uh, does work out for us, right? So that's another advice I can give. Um, yeah, choose boring technology. I mean, it's obvious if you think about it, but um, if you practice it, it actually turns out nicely also. Right, we threw out also all the do-it-yourself frameworks we threw out and replaced it with Spring Boot because Spring Boot is well documented. It's maybe not as exciting as, as writing your own stack, but um, yeah, still. And we threw out Project Lombox um, and then rather introduced Java 17 records and we threw out all Groovy and Kotlin, as I mentioned before. Right. So, um, it also something we had to tackle is um, in the beginning, people chose the easy path and we started with 2017 was the first year we supported a new system. And then people basically just, uh, in the new year, they basically took the code base and they copied it into a new <laughs> uh, rep repository and then they made the changes that were uh, valid for the next year. Because the, the thing is, um, we're not done with the 2017 taxes yet, because you can still have changes. Maybe you remember that you had this offshore bank account and you uh, regret you didn't tax it. So then you come to us and you say like, you know what, I should have paid more taxes in 2017 and we have to, be able to do back taxes 10 years. So in order to not disturb the old years, the idea was, all right, you know what, we just copy it. And um, that, that way we make sure that changes for the new year don't affect the old years, right? It's a simple theory and it worked out nicely in the beginning, but of course the code base grew and then suddenly you find a security vulnerability in your code and you have to go through 10 repos uh, and, and or 10 clones of thousand services and um, fix it all. Right, obviously it didn't work well. So we started doing like a year independent version since 2019. And uh, here again, we invested a bit of time um, because we created like a structural typing uh, approach because the only change that happens is that every year Scott Totten defines a new XSD that's the taxation data that determines how you uh, tax, right? So what we did basically since these uh, XMLs look very similar from year to year, the, the most integral parts of the tax system don't change from year to year. So the most integral parts can be reused, and basically all that you change is the namespace uh, because we get a new um, we get a new XSD. So we created like a, a Maven plugin that uh, parses XSDs and generates an, an XSD that supports all year versions. And then if something new comes in, it basically just defines this as an optional property. And then you can say like, if this new tax property exists, then do this. And yeah, also this was a big investment, but uh, worked nicely for us, like challenging technical depth in this regard. All right, um, yeah, this is basically was our journey um, through refactoring. Uh, another big issue we had to solve uh, was um, following up production. Um, as you can imagine, um, if something goes wrong with the taxes, we have to be able to react uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so something again that we realized is that all our testers knew SQL and all of the testers want to have data. So in the beginning we had a big search cluster on Elasticsearch, but uh, only developers were basically able to write uh, queries to Elasticsearch, and our developers were already um, drowning in work. So we basically recreated <laughs> Elasticsearch in Oracle. Um, what we did is we basically parsed all the XSDs and automatically created XML schemas uh, for Oracle and pushed all data into Oracle. And now people can just search um, in Oracle and get any data out of it from all the documents that are normally stored in document storage. And yeah, this is basically the same message as I tried to convey before that boring technology is easily learned and then people actually use it. Like if you choose the right stack and, and Elasticsearch would definitely be the right option here, um, people won't be able to use it. And then if they won't be able to use it, you don't have any usage out of it. Um, Today we have 12 terabytes of data in one single Oracle instance and it works just fine. And all you have to do if you want to add something to the database, you add it in the YAML file and then the pipeline basically automatically pumps it in the database. Uh, also, this makes a really good security um, model because Oracle has um, auditing functionality. So if people log in with their own user, it will be stored uh, in the audit trail 
and we just pump it out so everybody can see what everybody looks up. So the idea that we have is that we uh, trust everybody but make everything visible. So if you search something, your colleagues will know, and if you search something dodgy, someone will hopefully ask you uh, what you're up to. Uh, also something that's very practical with audit trails is that if you have like an application that logs in, um, then the audit trail will also log SQL comments, so you can just add someone's user identity to the com as a comment to the, the query. It's a bit annoying because uh, you basically break Oracle's um, caches for queries, but all in all, that's not so bad for this kind of application. Yeah, also security-wise, um, that's something we reversed upon over time. In the beginning, we had very fine-grained accesses, and um, you had to ask for permission before you did something, but um, we found out that uh, that blocks people a lot because you have to wait for getting permits and then typically what people will do is they will wait for the permit and not do anything in the meantime. Uh, so instead now you have, you get a lot of trust from us, so of course we vet people before they come in. Scottertown has a lot of sensitive data, but uh, in general sense you will get access to a lot of information uh, and then rather we follow up on what you, be. so we monitor people pretty closely what they look into and then we rather ask why they did this, right? If they did something dodgy, but our experience is that people are quite responsible. So also since they know that everybody sees what everybody looks up. Um, then another thing we, we did is that the big numbers that we constantly ask for, we can now, since we have this big database with all the data, we can just create material views out of the data and display it in a big web page that is available to everybody in Scottetown. So we can, for example, see how many taxation reports that we uh, uh, get out, um, how many globally uh, taxable people are there in Norway right now, and then the people that aren't working with the tech but with the numbers and basically checking if everything is consistent, they can just um, read these numbers automatically out from a web page. Um, also, we have wrote a lot of internal, like we wrote a lot of internal tooling. We used a lot of time on that to basically free developers uh, of the responsibility to do admin things. And again, here this is a screenshot of an administration tool we wrote that gives access to all the applications. You can, um, and uh, yeah, and importantly, again, we always know who you are, so we log everything you do. But so since you have so much access, we will audit very carefully and then go through these audit logs regularly. And yeah, people then can just uh, look up, for example, how does someone's taxation look like in production. So this is normally something you don't want to do. Um, and then we try to shield anything, but you can, in worst case, get access to anything that's out there pretty quickly. Um, yeah. And the third thing we did is that um, instead of, we found out that retroactively um, looking up errors that we find uh, took a lot of time. So every time we found a bug in our code, and of course we already sent out tax reports, so what we do now is that every month we um, compute the taxes for all of Norway um, from scratch and just compare uh, the, the actual tax report we send out with the hypothetical tax report that we would send out. We do just an XML diff and then we mark all the differences and then someone will go through them and then we consider if it's worth correcting because of course we could fix all mistakes, but sometimes if we did something in favor of people, then um, we won't even demand back these 200 crowns because it annoys people more than it's worth. And we kind of also are need to keep a good reputation with people, otherwise uh, Scottetown will be in bad shape at some point. Yeah, a uh, last advice I can give, uh, same as with the technology check, the tooling stack we kept very lean. We, only, we use OpenShift, obviously, um, but other than that, we only use Grafana and Splunk. We decided against uh, things like distributed tracing, APM tooling, and so forth, because people need to learn it. And as I said before, like if people are with us for three to four years, this learning phase will add another month to everybody's um, menu. And, and then rather we invest that people really know how to use Grafana and really know how to use Splunk. Many times I feel like people just get these tools and like here you can look up logs, but they haven't really learned how to write queries in Splunk. So we just give them two days to learn it, they can take a course, and that's very well invested time, something people often forget. Right, so I'm basically through, this is <laughs> the lessons learned. So summarized, yeah, avoid superhero developers, this is what's probably the most important thing um, we realized, um, because that way people get a break, once they are off, they won't be called up for every, any problem that uh, touches their domain. Um, yeah, choose boring technology, keep a lean stack, 
don't don't um, go crazy on the new new tech and yeah make your stack learnable. Um, yeah, that's that. And create create a culture to write code that doesn't yeah demand a lot from especially young people that just learn how to program. And yeah, don't assume people know tech. Even the seniors don't assume that someone who's been in the business for 10 years knows Grafana necessarily or Splunk. Uh, give them also time to, to, to teach themselves how to use the tooling. And uh, yeah, replace stale code over time. Really touch the code bases that have been there forever. And um, yeah, throw out what you can't maintain because at some point it will be an issue. Right. And that's it, Bina, for me. Thank you so much for <laughs> listening to my ramblings. And yeah, I'm here for five more minutes, so if you have any questions, I can take them now. Otherwise, you can find me. Uh, I'm here for most of the day, so thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Otherwise, yeah. Um, so what we're currently struggling with, ba basically the same things, just to a lower degree. So this is like, I'm not aiming to be done with this project at any time. And that's basically a realization that I had at some point. You kind of always work against some horizon that you will never reach. Um, but yeah, I mean, we still, we still are in a migration phase. And we haven't really said that we will be done by day X. So we have to anticipate new struggles right right now obviously we have to had shift uh, we had to shift a lot to security uh, because of how things are <laughs> i mean we should always prioritize security but of course you'd make a trade-off there as well um, but yeah i mean it's still we still have some people that um, would be difficult to lose so we try to uh, document a lot. We wrote a lot of do documentation in every component now, in basically in GitHub, so that the documentation follows the code base uh, and prepare ourselves basically for replacing people. Because otherwise, yeah, we, we know that people will leave. We can't just ignore the fact. So that's our main focus right now to avoid that people leaving take the information in the head with them. So I think that's where we're still the most vulnerable. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, so what we did is all the technical bits that we write, so that are not domain-centric, are English, and all um, domain things are Norwegian. And um, that makes it easier, like we have the same domain language as the, the experts who don't know how to code. And also from the code, it's pretty obvious um, what is what. So it, you don't only have like a separation and modularity, like even if you brand modules in one source file, you know what's technical bits and what's non-technical bits. And I mean, we, we aren't hardcore in the sense that we like translate words like get and set, as some people do, so we try to be reasonable there. Um, <clears throat> but especially like the text language in itself, I wouldn't even know what most of the things are in English. <laughs> so so it's that, that's the, the idea that we have there. Mm, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, I mean, there's a lot of immigrants in Skaditan, but we all speak decent Norwegian. I think it's a, sort of a requirement. And um, <clears throat> yeah, we, ha we have some people, but they, they get a hang of it. Because normally, like the, the text language is no language that you know from before. You don't know all these words. I mean, I could name examples now, but you will have to learn them anyway. So it's like learning a new language in the language. Um, and and they all pretty technical, like Tolldela or Skattemelding. This is nothing you chat about in the bar. <laughs> Hopefully, I mean some people do, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we're doing some some experiments there. So um, the question was how how we deal with um, um documentation of the non-technical bits. So we try to testify our documentation now. We see like that we use Cucumber or something um, and write scenarios that are actually run in code at a later point. Um, but yeah, so basically our documentation, since we modularized, so, so all the technical bits are supposed to be in modules of their own. Um, and, and yeah, so, so the, I mean the technical bits, I, I skipped this slide, I think. So the technical bits we put on GitHub anyway, so if you want to see 
like the structural type stuff or our task processing that's there and it's documented there. Um, and, and like the same main readme, like if in GitHub, if you have a readme file um, in the main folder, readme.md, you, you have like this big thing. And um, every component that we have that's technical or non-technical uh, will have, hopefully have uh, all of its contents described in this readme. And all the technical documentation is in these technical components and all the non-technical documentation is in non-technical components. But, but I mean, now we try to basically that people can write Cucumber specifications in Jira and then it automatically converts to a test and then you can reopen the Jira issue to, to run the test. And then the idea is that the, we have more resources on the, on the non-technical bits than we have on technical bits so that the non-technical people can run their own tests. That, that was the idea behind it. But this is work in progress. We'll see where we get with that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so we're out of time anyway. So, but yeah, thank you so much, and yeah, see you around. Take care. <clears throat>